Amen. I would ask you this morning, what does it mean to truly live? You know, not merely just eke out an existence in like 2021 America, but what does it mean to thrive? What does it mean to flourish? What does it mean to do well? What does it mean to prosper? What does it mean to have a good life? Like, what does that look like? Is it to be satisfied in your career? Is it to reach a financial milestone? Is it to have a family and have kids that are reasonably put together and haven't set anything on fire yet today? Is it to be well thought of by others? Is it to have lots of friends? Is it to have lots of social mobility? Is it health? Is it relatively sickness-free? And before you get nervous, I have not flipped over to a prosperity gospel preacher, so don't worry. I'm not going to go health and wealth on us this morning. But I do want us to spend time this morning considering that question. How does the Bible define what it means to truly live? How does the Bible define what it means to truly live? And to answer that question, we are continuing our Advent series in Isaiah. And as Len had read for us over in Isaiah chapter 53, the great Charles Spurgeon called Isaiah 53 the Bible in miniature and the gospel in essence. He called chapter 53 of the prophet Isaiah the Bible in miniature and the gospel in essence. And I hope you saw some of that this morning. Let's uh, refresh our memory. Last week we looked at the, the famous prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 9. Unto us a son will be born, will be given. He will come to save. There will literally be a child be born. The Savior that was unique, that was unexpected. The Savior that can be no one else other than Jesus Christ. Has to be Jesus Christ. The unique, one of a kind, son of God. Who will bring light to the darkness. Who is both God and man. Who is the king of the ages. This is indeed what the world, and particularly our Jewish friends, would still stumble over today, that this cannot be the Messiah. This, this is not the Messiah we expected, yet, church, we know that Jesus is the Savior that we all need. may not be the one we expected. This message, the message that a Savior could come in the form of a baby, and then that Savior would grow up to be a man who would then be uh, crucified, rejected, crucified, and mocked is hard to believe. And that's how Isaiah started his passage in chapter 53. If you remember, Len read a few moments ago for us, who has believed what he has heard from us? And who has the arm of the Lord? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a, dry, like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Verse 1 picked, is picked up not once but twice in the New Testament to demonstrate the unbelievability of this gospel, the unbelievability of a baby who was, who was born who would be the Messiah. No one seriously would believe that. That's how Isaiah and later on Paul and Romans says that. Look at how Isaiah describes this coming Messiah in our text. He says, nothing out of the ordinary, just a baby. He's just going to grow up. And parents, I get it. All kids are special. All babies are cute. I understand that. I'm with you there. All babies are beautiful. But the kind of Messiah that we're going for here really isn't the one that's going to be born as a baby, right? They were expecting something completely different. And in that sense, he was kind of just like a baby, like all the other babies. Looked like a baby. He was really cute. He grew up. Isaiah goes on to say, it's actually worse than that as he grew up. He was despised. He was rejected by Men, we just sang it. He's a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And if you know your Bibles and the gospel story, you know this is alluding to the fact that the Messiah will be the one who is rejected. Who's rejected especially by his own people and many others. He will be hated. We see this in many places, but maybe one in John chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, picks up on this very thing where we read this. He was in the world and the world was made through him, right, he created the world, yet the world did not know him. 
he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. That's what it's saying about the Messiah. Already we see fulfillment in Jesus Christ from Isaiah in the first few verses of the fact that Jesus came to his own, but his own rejected him. They didn't get it. They didn't see him as the Messiah. He will be rejected ultimately to the point of being executed as a criminal on a Roman cross. Why? And that is probably the most important question in biblical Christianity. Why did Jesus have to go to the cross? Why did the Savior give himself up to die on the cross? And that is the essence of what I want to get to this morning. And there are a host of reasons. But in the context of this passage, I want to look at just a few and see if we can apply that to what it means for us. Look again at our passage in Isaiah 53 and verse 4. It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. Did you guys track that? He has borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement, the punishment, the judgment that brought us peace and by his wounds by his stripes we are healed the apostle peter directly quotes this and claims this is jesus the messiah in first peter chapter one sorry two verses 24 he says he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness watch this by his wounds you have been healed Peter picking up on that and saying, Jesus Christ, whom we worship in the New Testament church, is the fulfillment of Isaiah 53, and he quotes it directly there. What is Isaiah saying? What is Peter saying? The answer to the question of why was the Savior delivered up is because we needed him to. The Savior was sacrificed in our place. The text said it. We're the ones that have the grief. We're the ones that have the sorrow. We're the ones that have the sins and the iniquities, the transgressions. He did not deserve any punishment at all because he was sinless and he was perfect. He was God in the flesh. We, on the other hand, are the ones who are sinful and in need of someone to save us, and we cannot do it ourselves. And so reason number one, the Savior was delivered up as our substitute. The Savior was delivered up as our substitute. This is the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. Now, before you take a nap, like, listen, this is really, really, really important. The idea that Jesus sacrificed himself, he substituted himself in our place. Atonement being the idea of making right. The atonement idea of of settling the wrath of God, of satisfying, rather, the wrath of God. You're atoning for sin. You are paying for sin. We can't do that ourselves. Why not? Because we're sinful. Because all we're bringing to the party is more sin. We need someone perfect and someone eternal in order to do that in our place. We can't do it ourselves. And the church has believed this for 2,000 years. And three quotes to kind of set that up of where we are and, and where, we are, where we were and where we are now. First, first century church father Clement of Rome said this, Because of his love for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord, gave his blood for us by the will of God. He gave his flesh for us and his soul for our souls. This is within decades of Jesus ascending back to the Father. It's carried through from what we just read in Isaiah 53. It's carried through in 1 Peter. And it's carried through in the early church fathers in the first century. Substitutionary atonement church is the bullseye of historic orthodox biblical christianity you remove it and the whole thing falls apart you cannot remove the idea of substitutionary atonement yet this is exactly what is happening today in progressive christian churches and certainly in atheistic and agnostic circles it is ignored it is marginalized it is rejected 
it is even mocked. Atheist scholar and New York Times bestselling author Richard Dawkins writes in his book, The God Delusion. He says, I've described atonement, the central doctrine of Christianity, which at least he gets that right, as vicious, sadomasochistic, and repellent. We should also dismiss it as barking mad. If God wanted to forgive our sins, why not just forgive them without having himself tortured and executed in payment? This is what is said about the sacrifice of our Lord by best-selling, New York Times best-selling authors. And as brilliant as Dawkins may be, he completely misses the point as far as why God just can't simply forgive sin. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way with us, and it certainly doesn't work that way with God. You see, God is king and sovereign ruler over all of his creation. His subjects have rejected him. His subjects have rebelled against him, scorning his rule, his reign, his, his throne, denying and defaming his holy name, his character, his authority. And Dawkins just wants God to sweep that under the carpet like nothing happened. Like it or not, we violated the king of kings by turning from him and making ourselves kings of our own little sub-kingdoms within his kingdom. Amends need to be made. My good friend R.C. Sproul has the classic quote on this. He says, sin is cosmic treason. Sin is treason against a perfectly pure sovereign. It is an act of supreme ingratitude towards the one whom we owe everything. To the one who has given us life itself. We are saying to our creator when we disobey him at the slightest point, we're saying no to the righteousness of God. We're saying, God, your law is no good. My judgment is better than yours. Your authority does not apply to me. I am above and beyond your jurisdiction. I have the right to do what I want to do, not what you command me to do. This goes way beyond just making poor choices in life, doesn't it? This is sin. And this just cannot simply be swept under the carpet. It cannot simply just be forgiven. And again, we can't be the ones to fix that. We need a substitute. It is a debt that we owe that we can't possibly pay, and yet God paid it with the blood of his own son in our place. So instead of calling what that is as sadomasochistic and repellent, how about calling God merciful and gracious and full of kindness and love and falling down on our faces before him and worshiping him for his grace? Dawkins will have to have that conversation with God at judgment if he's able to stop weeping and get out of, get out of the fetal position. And this plan of God... Rather, it needs to be loved, it needs to be honored, it needs to be esteemed, it needs to be celebrated, it needs to be worshipped. And indeed, church, we will do that for all of eternity. Shameless plug for Wednesday night midweek with the, the lamb around the throne, people just worshipping. Worthy are you. Why? The lamb who was sacrificed. That's why you're worthy to be worshipped for all of eternity. That's why you're the one who can open the seven seals of the scroll. That's why you're the one who's going to come again. Why? Because he's the lamb slain. Because he did it. This plan of God, we need to worship. We need to revel in. Indeed, we will do that again for all of eternity. In the last days, we will see what happened, truly what we've been spared from. But without it, we're still stuck in our sin. And that's where Isaiah goes next. Look at verse 6 of Isaiah 53. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one. Well, where does the Bible say that we're all sinners? Uh, Isaiah 53, 6 for one, right? We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Bible says that we are all sinners by nature and choice. Meaning that we're, we're sinners by nature. Thank you, Adam. We're human beings. We're, our first parents sinned, and therefore it's in our DNA. We are cursed, but we all sin by choice as well. Right? Anybody who's the parent of a toddler knows about original sin. Right? You don't have to teach them how to sin. You don't have to teach them how to hit or say no or steal anybody's toys or anything like that. They're just cute little sinners. Right? They are... <laughs> 
They're, we're sinners by nature and by choice. So why was the Savior delivered up to die? Because we sinned. Because his holiness was violated. Because sin exists. So there must therefore be a sacrifice for that sin to make things right to satisfy the justice and holiness of God. Sin has cursed his perfect creation. And so the answer for the second point, the, the Savior, why was he delivered up? He was delivered up for sin. He was delivered up for sin. If there was no sin, there wouldn't need to be a sacrifice. But sin exists. There needs to be a sacrifice. That's kind of the whole point. We are the ones who are unjust, and God the just makes it right. Elsewhere in 1 Peter chapter 3, in a wonderful gospel summary verse, if you ever wanted to summarize the gospel in one verse, it'd be hard to beat 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous, right? He's the righteous for the unrighteous. That's us. Why? That he might bring us to God. That's the point of the gospel. Piper wrote a great book called God is the Gospel. That's the point. The point of the gospel is that we are reconciled back to our creator. The point of the gospel is that we worship God and serve God. And we can't do that because of sin. And so God did what we could not do. But he had to do it because sin exists. This is the goal of the gospel. The goal of the gospel is, is again, not health and wealth or prosperity. The goal of gospel, the gospel is that we get God. We get access to God that we didn't have before. We all know sin exists. We might try and soften the subject by calling it something else. Everybody makes mistakes or everyone's still growing or whatever, but at its root, it's all sin. Evil exists in this world. We see the effects of sin in sickness and chronic illness and cancer and things like that. We even saw it in the news in Kentucky and Missouri where Tornadoes have completely devastated that area down there. We need to be praying for them. We see the effects of sin that have cursed God's perfect creation. The Savior was delivered up because sin exists. But consider this, church. God didn't have to create a plan that included salvation. He really didn't. This points to his unbelievable grace even more. We're the ones that reject. He didn't have to save anyone. He could have just left us in our own failed experiment. The moment that we turned to sin, he could have said, well, that didn't work. Oh, well, tough luck for them. I tried. I gave them everything. I gave them me. I gave them perfection. I gave them all these good gifts, and they still turned on me and turned to themselves. I'm done. He could have done that, but he didn't. God in his amazing sovereignty knew that we would turn from him, that we would make ourselves our own kings again of our little mini sub-kingdoms. The Savior Church was always part of the plan. It wasn't a reaction when God saw the Garden of Eden happening. It was always part of the plan, showing his grace because he knew about sin. He foresaw, he foreknew that would happen. Can you imagine just for a second being left in your own sin? in your own sickness, in your own weakness, just victims of cancer or chronic illness, not to mention, again, natural disasters, just evil running loose in the world, and there's no answer for it at all. This is the hopelessness of the atheistic worldview, which, by the way, no one lives like that. The atheistic worldview is completely inconsistent because everybody knows that there's meaning. Everybody knows that something's out there. Everybody feels that. But yet they claim that we are just bags of mostly carbon and water walking around on some space rock that have nothing to do with anything, ultimately. That is not the truth, and we know it. Our God in his amazing sovereignty, his amazing grace, knew. And the Savior was always part of the plan. Can you imagine, again, the hopelessness of being left? But this is also the hopelessness of progressive Christian theology. Church, this is an, an, an encroaching heresy in the church. We see progressive Christianity. We see the, the social gospel, so to speak. We see all of these things that are encroaching on the, on the church that are then taking as their targets things like substitutionary atonement. Things like the actual existence of sin. Things like the actual total depravity of man. 
and things like making us the center instead of God. It makes God the plan of salvation. The author of the plan of salvation then bow to our own intellect. That's what a guy like Dawkins is saying. It's like, no, that's ridiculous. The fact that he would send his own son to die, that is ridiculous. I'm glad you think so, but it's not up to your own intellect. It's not what you think about God's plan of salvation. It is the understanding that we need. We don't get to pick and choose which biblical truth we want to believe. We've got to believe all of it. The reality of the presence of sin is ugly, and that sin must be punished with the same level of intensity of sin itself. Look at verse 7. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. The Savior would be oppressed. And, and, and church, just for the record, right? There's no one who's ever been more oppressed in the history of the world than Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is perfect. Jesus Christ is sinless. No one else is perfect and sinless. Yet did he defend himself? He did not. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter without making a sound. The Gospels give all the accounts of a silent Jesus before his accusers. In Acts 8, in a really fun encounter with Philip and an Ethiopian man who was reading the Bible out loud, they quote this exact passage. Look at Acts 8, starting in verse 30. Philip rolls up on this guy. So Philip ran over to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? I love that. Do you understand what you're reading? Nope, not a clue. <laughs> Don't understand it. Do you understand what this is saying? He said, how can I? And he invited Philip to, Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of Scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep that was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth in humiliation. Justice was denied to him. Who can describe his generation? For his life was taken away from the earth. Philip, again, and Luke, the author of Acts, quoting directly from the Septuagint, or directly from Isaiah, in our passage in Isaiah 53. And then the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does this prophet say this is about himself or someone else? There's the million-dollar question, Philip. Who is this talking about? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. Church, the Bible says many, many places that Jesus is the Messiah. That Jesus is the one that has fulfilled. And here is an extremely clear example of Jesus fulfilling and how the disciples understood that, yeah, Jesus was the Messiah that was to come from Isaiah 53. More particularly, Luke, the author of Acts, of course, tells us point blank in Isaiah that what we're looking at is Jesus Christ. The Savior that Isaiah foretold is Jesus, and he was led to the slaughter, and he did not make a sound. Why not? Because it was part of the plan. Jesus wasn't going to say, no, 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 don't do this. I'm innocent. Jesus wasn't going to call down legions of angels to destroy them and turn them into smoldering piles of dust. He knew what he had to do. It was part of the plan, and he didn't make a sound. He did not object. He was cut off from the living. He was stricken for the transgression of the people. The Savior will die, and he will be buried. And that's part of it, too. Why was the Savior delivered up? He was delivered up to die. That was part of the plan. Jesus had to go all the way. Jesus had to actually die. This is not often appreciated as part of the reason why Jesus came, but he actually came to die. That's part of the plan. He actually had to really die in order to fulfill the sacrifice. There have been all kinds of heretical ideas throughout the millennia of church history trying to tell us that Jesus wasn't really dead. He was knocked unconscious. He was under the influence of uh, psychotic drugs. 
He took his bandages off and the 200 pounds of spices and then ran seven miles in the other direction. It's just all nonsense. Well, of course, it's nonsense, right? Dead people don't rise from the grave, right? That's what's so hard to believe. If Dawkins were around then, I'm sure he would call that barking mad as well. People just don't do that. Unless you're Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Unless you're God in the flesh, then you do. Unless it's part of the plan that you actually do need to actually die and then actually be resurrected by God the Father to prove that your sacrifice was worthy. We can't, another thing, we can't take away the actual death of Jesus Christ. People are like, oh, it's just gruesome and it's ugly and did he really die? I don't know. I don't think that's very important. You can't take it away. It is historical, orthodox, biblical Christianity. And actually it's because the punishment fits the crime when we think about it. Sin is death, and therefore death is the only payment for sin. It has to be that way. In the Garden of Eden, God told our first parents if they disobeyed him, what would happen? They would die. Romans tells us that sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. Therefore, that's why all men die. Romans also tells us that the wages of sin, what you get from sin, what sins just do is what? Death. James tells us that sin, when fully grown, gives birth to death. It's the reason we have funerals. The reality of death is because of sin. That is why. And so Jesus, by actually dying, defeated death. He actually defeated sin. It has to be that way. He died so death would die. He couldn't not die. We can't just take that part out. And 1 Corinthians tells us because of Jesus' death, death itself is defeated famously. A famous funeral passage itself for believers and, and the hope in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 says, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. By Jesus dying, he defeated death. He rendered it powerless. Church, this is the hope of Christians and only of Christians that we have. The loved ones that many of us are mourning right now, that, that Christmas and the holidays and a new year coming and all of that has a wonderful way of reminding us about the loved ones that we have lost. As Christians, our hope is the reality of eternal life. The reality of what Jesus' death and resurrection won for us. The reality that our loved ones, although we mourn, we will see them again through faith in Jesus Christ. This is not the plan of a vicious, sadomasochistic God. This church is really the only way to give us true life. Look at verse 10 in Isaiah 53. It says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The answer to the age-old question of, of who killed Jesus is, is actually the Father. It's, it's the answer according to Isaiah 53. God himself, God the Father, as part of the plan, put Jesus on the cross. We see it. It was the will of the Father to crush him. That is why Jesus died. Because God the Father planned it. He had to put him to grief. But we all know that, of course, the story doesn't end there. Jesus doesn't stay dead. The plan is not only that he had to die, but that he had to be resurrected as well. And we have all kinds of hints right here in Isaiah, 700 years before it happened, about a resurrection. Look at verse 10 again. We will see, he will see, rather, his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. That is super hard to do if you're going to stay dead. But the Savior is not going to stay dead. He's going to be resurrected. He's going to be alive. And so if you ever wonder where the resurrection is prophesied in the Old Testament, this is a really good place to go to. This is inferring directly that there will be a resurrection. And of course, we see that fulfilled in Jesus Christ. As we are united in his death, we are also united in his life. And that's where I want to land the plane this morning. So why did the Savior need to die? He needed a substitute. 
Because of sin, sin required death. That sacrifice then is the only way to actually bring true life. If we go back to our little supporting passage in 1 Peter chapter 2 again, we'll hopefully tie all that together. Look at 1 Peter again, refresh our memory in 2.24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, on the cross. Here it is. So that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. That's the answer to what true life actually is. That's the answer, ultimately, of what Jesus came to do so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And so I'll say the big idea this way. The Savior was delivered up so that we might truly live. The Savior was delivered up so that we might truly live. And we're right back again to our substitute, right back again to sin being the reason he was delivered up, that he was delivered up to pay for that sin with the ultimate price of his life. And when we celebrate Advent, we celebrate the coming of a Savior who was delivered up. We must tie it all together with what the Bible says were the reasons that he had to be delivered up. And we can't soften any of these, church. We can't give up any ground in these biblical doctrines of why. One podcaster recently said, today's orthodoxy is tomorrow's heresy. Th- these things that we're saying now, it's like, oh, well, it would be impossible to think that, that Jesus didn't actually die. Well, we'll wait to see where we are in a couple years, right? Because people are saying it now. Today's orthodoxy is tomorrow's heresy. Some of the things we see now in our society. You ever have that moment where you just kind of do the, the, the forehead rub? And just be like, how did we get here? In this clown world, how did we possibly get here? Where everything's upside down, where evil is celebrated, it's, this is how. Because today's orthodoxy is tomorrow's heresy. And church, we must hold the line on our biblical doctrine. We have to. There's stuff happening in our own town. Of stuff, or who is running churches and, and how they live their lives, making a mockery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to hold the line on biblical doctrine, not in a harsh legalistic way, but in a speaking the truth in love. That's one of the weird things about as dark as everything is getting outside, it doesn't really, you don't have to really try that hard to stick out, right? <laughs> because everything's getting so weird back here in culture. It's like if you take a little bit of a stand on biblical doctrine and say, mm, I don't think so according to the Bible, you're sticking out like a sore thumb. And we've got to hold the line in biblical doctrine on that. And in that, that's the life, the sense of living to righteousness, which we can't do without the Savior who was delivered up for us. And church, that is true life. What does it mean to live to righteousness and have true life? It means to live the abundant life that God has for us, his children in Jesus Christ. One that is overflowing with worship and fulfillment and joy, all found in God himself. One that does not find any of those things in sin. We don't go looking for all of our fulfillment and joy and satisfaction in sin, but yet we fulfill ourselves in him, in Christ in righteousness. It's the opposite of sin. I know righteousness is kind of one of those bible words, right? But sin is the opposite of righteousness. Christians aren't just called to stop sinning. We've got to remember that. And if you're going to go protest somebody and put things on a sign, tell them to stop sinning, take the sign down, put it in your fireplace, burn it away. You're not just called to tell them to stop sinning. You're called them to start living to righteousness. They have, they're two sides of the same coin. We, of course, must kill, mortify sin, but we're also called to replace it with living righteously. And that is true life. Because that is pleasing to God, church, and that is our greatest joy. Anyone who has ever come to the realization that sin actually doesn't deliver what it's selling, you get to that point. You're just like, this is emptiness. This is brokenness. There's nothing here for me. You'll never reach that point with Jesus. You will never exhaust the wonders of his grace. You will never exhaust the fulfillment and the joy and the blessing and the abundance that is in Jesus. 
The other side, of course, is the benefit, the blessing. The application of the work of the Savior being delivered up is for our life to be found in him. Abundant, prosperous, and a life overflowing with meaning and purpose and connection because it's connected to our creator. See how that works? We get connected to the guy who actually made us and we live like he's supposed to tells us that we're supposed to live. Why? Not as a cosmic killjoy, because maybe it's the best life we could possibly have, living the way he called us to. That is life. That is truly living. Not merely scratching out an existence. Not surviving, but thriving. That is what we celebrate. The terrible reality of what we've been saved from by our Savior who has been delivered up for us. The Savior that was delivered up so that we might truly live. Let's pray that we can realize this. Let's pray that we can walk in this. Let's pray that the Lord will help us see those ways that we are maybe giving in to that life of sin instead of trusting and walking in him. And let's pray that this Christmas, these truths become sweet to our souls. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this word. It's a bit of a strange text to be preaching from in Advent, Lord. But we realize that this is the reason that you planned your plan of redemption. That our Savior would be delivered up. Our Savior would be delivered up as our substitute because we could not pay for our sin. Delivered up because sin exists. And he was delivered up to do the work completely. To die. So that death and sin may die. And Lord, in that, that that great exchange that understanding that you take our sin, you bear our sin on the cross, on the tree. So what? So that we might die and live to righteousness. Help us, Lord, to milk that for everything it's worth this Christmas. This Advent, may we wholeheartedly pursue joy in Jesus and living righteously. Help us, God, as we seek to be in community with one another, as we seek to point people to Jesus this Christmas where maybe conversations might come a little more easily. We pray ultimately that you would be glorified through our lives as you connect us back to our God and loving, gracious, heavenly Father. We pray it in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.